morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. So glad to see each and every one of you here this morning, and I especially want to welcome those who are joining us online. We are so happy that you chose to start your Sunday and start your week with us. So once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please join me in our opening prayer. Maker of all, parent of all, destiny of all. We lift our voice to you in the praise and adoration. We give thanks that you are with us with love and fair air. We lift our hands and hearts to you. Source of our hope and courage. We give thanks for your spirit and welcome you into this place and into our hearts. We lift our voice to you in praise and adoration. We give thanks that you are with us in love and fair air. We lift our hands and hearts to you. Consecrator of us all, as your wondrous creations, we open our hearts and our minds to the glorious future into which you call all of your children and all of creation. We lift our voice to you in praise and adoration. To give thanks that you are with us in the love of your hair. We lift our hands and hearts to you. May this people in this place shine with your abundant love. Come, Come blessed Lord. Come. Come. Amen. Would you all please rise and join me in singing our opening hymn, One Bread and One Body.
Please be seated. Join me now in our gathering prayer. We give thanks to you, O God, for you are good, for your steadfast love endures forever. You have redeemed us from trouble and gathered us in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. When we cry to you in trouble, you bring us out of our distress. We thank you, God, for your steadfast love, for your wonderful works to humankind. We lift up your name here in the congregation of the people and praise you in the assembly of the elders. We worship you here today together. Amen. So, Hannah, let me grab you for a sec. Let me ask you to come out and join us. <laughs> See, that doesn't take long at all, does it? <laughs> and here is the star of the show. So, honey, you see, I'm, look up. Look up. No, 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 look up at me. Now, usually I'm down on my knee, right? But the reason why I'm not today is because, can you say because? Because I want you to know that no matter how big I am or small I am, you are still living in my heart. And everyone that you see here, no matter how big they are, no matter how small they are, no matter how low they are, no matter how high they are, you live in our hearts. And you know what I hope happens? I hope we live in your heart too. So remember that we love you and that God loves you too. Can you just say that little piece? God loves me too. There you go. And that is the content of the gospel. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Now wave and you'll come back that way and help me serve communion, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And once again, so I can sort of break it down for you all. I mean, because that, that was the big 2,000 foot thing. But no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how strong, no matter how weak, no matter how in a good mood, no matter how in a cranky kind of mood, because you're not know, gonna get cranky every now and then. God loves you and you live in each other's hearts. And that is the content of the gospel. Not that you know scripture. I mean, it's good. It's a good thing to know scripture. Read your Bible. That's a good thing. <laughs> Not that you know the songs of the church. That's a good thing too. Learn the songs of the church. Not that you figured out how to be a Christian in public. That's important too. But the most important thing is to remember that we as a church live in one another's hearts. And from that, we gain knowledge that we are never, ever, ever alone. That we are never, ever alone. That we are always with us in our hearts and in our prayers. And such is the gospel. Now, that's not the sermon from the day. I mean, I don't preach all day. That's not the sermon from the day. Join me now in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, you tell us to love one another, to love others the way we so naturally love ourselves. Yet each of us must admit that we have failed to do so. Jesus taught us to love our neighbors, even if they don't look like us, even if they don't think like us, even if they don't love like us, even if they don't pray like us, even if they don't speak like us, even if they don't love like us. But we have failed to love one another with no exceptions. Forgive us, Holy One, and make us again in your image of love. Blot out our sins, renew our minds, rekindle our hearts, and guide us by your Holy Spirit. In his love and his your will. Amen. Please join me now in our hymn of response.
sisters and brothers in Christ, God's Spirit did not leave us after that first Pentecost. The Spirit is still with us, empowering us to know mercy and grace, forgiveness and service. In this Spirit and through Christ, we proclaim the good news. We are, we are forgiven. forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Um, Jean Blue is unable to be here today as she and John recover from a stomach virus, so um, she asked me to fill in for her in reading the scripture. Let us listen to the word of God from Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with the unity of the Spirit, pardon me, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But to each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift, Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does that mean? But that he has also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. He himself granted that some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge and of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking true in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Now join us in singing hymn number 97, He's Got the Whole World. this morning, I thought about you all, 
And when I say I thought about you all, not to say that I don't always specifically have you in view. So I mean, I have always been a preacher that I imagine the audience that I'm going to be preaching to. But this, uh, when I was preparing this sermon, I did something a little bit different. I walked the aisles, if you will, and I looked at each and every one of you, and I thought about what the timbre of your voice was. I thought what it looked like when you smiled. I thought what it looked like when you were enjoying service, and I thought about your laughter and the ways that you present yourself in such beautiful ways to the world. So this sermon was one that I probably took about a good half hour just walking around in my mind and looking at and thinking about each and every one of you. And I thought particularly about your charisms. That's our word for the day, charisms. Those are the particular gifts that God gives us that are particular to us. The gifts that only we can bring to the church. So you can have a church of thousands, but there will only be one you. And the particular gift that God has given each and every one of you. I thought about that this morning and about the point that it is the irreplaceable you that I will be preaching to this morning the irreplaceable you. Now, as I gazed across the group that is us, there's a question that came to my mind. Who are we together as this people of God, as this gathered family of God, who are we in the hopes and dreams of God? You know, that's something we don't think much about but I think it's very important for us to stop and think for a moment, who does God dream of us becoming? Who does God hope that we will be? Not simply as a community, but in each of our lives, as individuals and as a community, who does God desire and need for us to be in and for this world that God loves so desperately? You know, one of the uh, 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 ways that we've read scripture and the tradition and that we shaped our faith that I think has not been quite on point has been the idea that God doesn't need us for anything, right? That God is going to be God all by God's self. That God is totally self-sufficient. But at least the scripture that I read was that from the very beginning, God wanted some company. God wanted someone to be with God. God wanted a creation that God could share, that God could be a part of. That's what the whole first three chapters of Genesis is about. It's about God making a creation and making us, and every day God made something new. And, you know, I get in my mind that it was like a little five or six-year-old that God made the plants and said, wow, that was cool. Let's see what else we can do. <laughs> and so God made the fish and God made the animals that were on the land. And then finally God made us. So the God that we worship, the God that is revealed to us in scripture is a God that needs company. Not because God isn't enough for God's self, but God chooses to be in relationship. So the question then becomes, what is it that God dreams for us? Because one of the things that we know very well, we as often as not live in ways that perhaps God isn't particularly keen on, but that's okay because God forgives us and God continues to extend the offer of love. But the question, what does God desire of us? What does God desire for us in this world that God loves so desperately? You know, in John 3.16, we are reminded, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that's the key right there, that God so loved the world. So whether it's that Christ was and is 
results from God's love for this world, or whatever the case, it is that God means for this world to be something of beauty that are viewed through the eyes of love. You know what it means to view something through the eyes of love, right? I mean, when you're in love with someone, or when you love someone, after you've loved them for a while, you literally have no idea what they look like. <laughs> it's true. When you are in a relationship, whether it is spousal, whether it is child and parent, parent and child, dear friend, for the people we love, we have no idea what they look like. Because if it is sincerely love, the only thing we see is through the gaze and gauze of that love. And God is very much the same way. Now, our text of the morning is a message from Paul to the still new church at Ephesus. A note about who they were and as important, who they were becoming. So he was reminding them of this thing. You're becoming something in the gaze of God's love. You're becoming somebody in the gaze of God's love. Now we talked in Bible study, uh, so I'm saying this so that nobody will say after service, well, you know, you took our idea and you didn't give us credit. So I'm just saying <laughs> right now, we talked about this in Bible study is that it is easy for us to forget that Ephesus, along the church at Ephesus, as well as all of the other churches to whom Paul was writing, were very young churches. They were very new churches. They were churches in the early point of their life. When Paul wrote this letter, the church at Ephesus was only about 15 years old, maybe 16 years old, tops. So it was still a very new church, and it was one that was still figuring out and discovering what it meant to be church, because they didn't have any examples. This, these were the first churches, so they didn't have any examples to look back on. Now, they could look back on perhaps the religious communities from which they came before they became Christians, those who were Jews, could look back on Judaism. Those who were Zoroastrians could look back on that. Those who were part of the mystery cults could look back on that. But they were the first ones who were making this thing up that we call church. They were the first ones. So Paul is giving them instruction about what it means to make a community uh, in the midst of all this. So they had patterns and they had titles. So in Paul's letter, he talks about apostles, prophets, teachers, etc. But they were still living into what all that meant. They didn't have a whole bunch of examples. So they may have seen one apostle in their lifetime, maybe two. They may have seen one teacher in their lifetime, maybe two. They may have seen one prophet in their lifetime, maybe two, but they hadn't seen many. They were still living into what they all meant. And in many cases, I'm sure, learning what these meant, not just for the community, but for the people as individuals living into these roles. Now I've been preaching for, now for about almost 35 years. And I can tell you that I am a very different preacher than I was 30 years ago, a very different preacher than I was 20 years ago, because I'm still discovering what it means to be a preacher in whatever world I'm living in, in whatever place I'm living in. So it is really the case then that Paul is writing to people that are still trying to not only figure out what the role means in the community, but what it means for me to be inhabiting this world. And this is all of the people that Paul is writing to. So Paul's admonition in our text to be about the work of building the body of Christ, the body of the one who came as an expression of God's love, is being given to a community that is making it up 
as they go along. Right? We can lose sight of that. We can think that they had it all figured out. So that's why I always chuckle when somebody reads one of the letters from Paul as if they all had it figured out. And all we have to do is see what they did. Well, remember, they were just figuring it out themselves. They were just trying to make sense of themselves. But more, they were a community of individuals who are discovering their gifts and their charisms along the way. So they were discovering what it meant to be a Christian, and they were discovering what it meant to be a Christian in the community of which they are a part. Now something that is gainsaid these days is that COVID changed everything. COVID changed the world. There are few parts of our communal and individual lives that remain untouched. I was reading about the commercial real estate in New York is worth just a fraction of what it was because companies have so many employees who are working remotely and because so many companies didn't make it through COVID. Prices, which went up because of supply chain issues, remain painfully high, and civic organizations struggle to maintain the audiences they once had. And churches continue to grapple with all of the social and cultural issues, which I've just named, as well as the ones that are part of just being church. Now, here at United, United Church on the Green, on top of all of that, as if that wasn't enough to deal with. On top of all of that, we have gone through three pastors in as many years, transition to a new pattern of church life. So we have ministry teams, we don't have boards and committees anymore, and we're figuring out what that means, and we've had our numbers diminished. Now, observing all of this, I'm not trying to bemoan as many do or explain our current situation. I leave that to folk who are far wiser than me. What I do want to raise from all of this is the reality that while we may be an old church, we've been around since 1742, that classifies as an old church. <laughs> While we may be an old church, we are a congregation in a new world. Yes. While we may have many who remember the old world in the former ways, the world which God so loves and into which God calls us as an expression of that love has changed. It is a different world. We find ourselves much like the church at Ephesus, trying to figure out the new thing to which God has called us, and to figure it out as a community and as individuals. Now, I was reading that very closely and word for word because that was what I really needed to get through, but this is where I wanted to get. You remember I said at the beginning that I had each and every one of you in my mind that I had you in terms of thinking about you. Well, what that meant was each of you has not just a charism, not just a gift from God that makes you you, that is a gift to us as the church. But like the church at Ephesus, you are building what will be God's gift to the world. Your presence, your love, your care, all that you do. And each of you is doing it in your own particular way. So I actually smiled a lot when I was writing this part of the sermon. Not that I don't always smile, but I take this role very seriously, you know, being a preacher. But I actually smiled because I thought to myself, I can look at people today and there will come a time when now they are new, but they will be the ones who are passing along the story to people 20 years from now. I look around and, and some of us probably won't be here 20, 25 years from now, but someone will remember that we were and the particular gift and talent and charism that we brought. 
I was telling, uh, and I don't like to call people out like this, but I'm going to anyway. I was telling Abram that one day, Hannah's going to grow up and we will be a part of who she is. We will be a part of whatever she is in the world. So all of the power, all of the joy, all of the wonder she brings into the world, we will have had a part in that. And that is the great gift that we have, that God gives us to bring a charism, not to just who the church is right now, not to just who the church was, but to who the church is becoming. And each and every single one of you, from our musician to the tech guys, to the people who read scripture faithfully, to the people who serve communion faithfully, to the people who've been here for 40, 45 years, to those who've been here for two months. We are all a part of God's work in this world. And each and every one of you, I'm gonna repeat that, because I'm not talking about y'all now, right? That's not what I'm talking about. Each and every one of you is a part of this gift that God has to the world that is United Church on the Hill. And we give thanks for each and every single one of you. Give thanks that you've been here. Give thanks that you are here. Give thanks that you will be here. Now, some preachers will tell you to look around at the gift that you are to each other, but we'll do that in coffee hour. <laughs> what I want you to do now is just sit for a moment with the wonderful gift that each and every one of you are in your own way, in the way that God made you. No matter the circumstance of your life, no matter the hill or the valley that you may find yourself in, you, the irreplaceable you, the only you that God saw fit to make is amongst this church, and we give thanks. We give thanks for each and every one of you, and we give God thanks that whatever it is that we do, will be a part of the history of this old church, but a church that's in a new time and in a new world. And for that, we give God thanks. Amen.
That was another one of those times where I thought if I sat there for a little bit, you might feel a little bit more, but that's not right. <laughs> we come to the time in our service now where we are with one another and perhaps one of the, great, one of the greatest gifts of being in community. We are able to share with one another the journey of this life, the hills and the valleys, the good times and the bad. We come to God in prayer as a community so that we might lift up what is heavy upon our hearts and we might rejoice for the things in our lives and do so as a community and not simply do it by ourselves. So I invite you to join me now in our prayer and after which we will lift up the particular prayers of our community. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We join our voices to pray and rejoice to celebrate the good things of our life together and those who are celebrating their birthdays this week, including Aaron Ash. We pray for the innocent who suffer in Gaza, Israel, and the world over because of war. We pray for our kin suffering under the systems of cruelty and oppression. We pray for our queer and trans siblings who are being persecuted in many lands across the world. We pray for those suffering the ravages of climate change across the globe. We pray for immigrants and refugees seeking sanctuary and safe harbor, and for our nation that we not lose regard for human dignity and work. We pray for all of this world's people that they may know hope and peace. We pray for the teachers, parents, and school staff that they may find peace and joy in several months. We pray for those suffering the plague of gun violence, with special prayers for the children killed and wounded here in New Haven these past weeks. We pray for those challenged by physical and mental illness, and we provide them. We pray for those suffering grief and loss in the passing of all ones for ourselves, that we may ever live in the power of hope. As is our custom, I invite you to lift up any people, situations, or concerns that you would like for us to be in prayer with you about. So I'd like to invite your prayers this morning. Prayers of healing for Ruth Ann Olson. God in your mercy. Hear our prayers. A prayer for the homeless or home uh, of thousands. God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We want to also lift up John Schneider, who is recovering at home, and we also want to lift up Christina Salinger, who is also recovering from the fall. Oh, okay. God in your mercy. Yeah. I'd like to pray for Roosevelt Village, the tiny house community, um, for the homeless, and um, their lights, the mirror shed the lights off in there. Yeah. So we're trying to get um, solar powers now. But I went over there yesterday and went the um, the thing is the same. Um, little houses that they the military fights our wars on that they have in their back pocket. And it was it was it it was, it was cute to see them. But my son's in the military and it's the same little you know, house that they set up to put. So if it's okay for our military, why is it okay for our homeless? Mm -hmm. God in your mercy. Yeah. Uh, I want to offer a prayer for the man who just had surgery, uh, as well as for Manuel Rosado, as a father, a close friend of mine, uh, who recently had a surgery. 
stroke while on vacation and he's having to reckon with the fact that he's going to be helping all the time now. Um, so I'm praying for that. We have several from online. From Christina, continuing prayers for my brother Peter. God be mercy. From Al, continuing prayers for John Schneider. Lord be mercy. As well as prayers for peace in the Middle East. Lord be mercy. From Catherine, prayers for all of those in the path of Storm Heavy. Lord be mercy. Yeah, and from Julie, prayers for safe travel for Jesse as she returns to Hawaii tomorrow. Lord have mercy. Yeah, I'd like to ask a prayer for all the street children in the world. There's a peace and wonders for the children. For a full cinema street, so I have to be for safety, housing, and love. God in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Join me now in prayer. Merciful and loving God. God who from the beginning has loved this world that is your creation with such fullness and with such hope. We come to you this morning lifting up all of those who have been named who are in need of healing who are in need of encouragement, whose hearts are in need of strength. God, we ask that you would allow your spirit to be with them, to give them encouragement, and to give those who care for them strength and hope. We ask that you would watch over all of your children who are a part of this community, but more, God, all of the people who are your children who are part of this world. We lift up your children who find themselves in the midst of war and in the midst of conflict when it seems as if human life is so cheap that you would remind all involved that each of us, every single one of us, is your child and is worthy of our love and is worthy of our faith. God, in this city and in this place, we pray for those who are homeless. We pray for those who are unhoused. And we pray that the systems which are keeping them that way might be humanized so that the resources of our commonwealth, the resources of our common strength, might be brought to bear so that people might find places to call home and might find the strength that comes from being in a place to call home. God, we ask that you would give us in this community, in this community that is this church, that is this city, that is this state, that is this nation, the wisdom to understand that the gifts that have been given to us are for us all to be shared and to be given strength so that all might prosper and all might know fullness. We ask that you would give us the wisdom and courage to be able to live in such worlds. And God, we ask that for each and every one in this church, that you would allow them to leave having been touched by your spirit, having been touched by your comforting care, having been touched by your finger of love. We lift all this up in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Beloved children of God, as we gather here this morning, 
we are the church. In this moment, we respond to the words of Jesus who tells us where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And it is with the power of Christ that we proclaim that this table is open to all people, no matter who you are or what you believe or what you've been told. Here at the Lord's table, we remember the simple gathering of the chosen family that came together for a meal that proclaimed the new way of being in this world. We remember God's radically inclusive love made real in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We remember the one who befriended the forgotten, embraced the outcast, and saw the image of God in all people. We remember the one who confronted every power that has disconnected, marginalized, oppressed, and other. It is here at this table we find hope and imagination to see God's dream and promise for all of us. And to see the nourishment and strength to continue in the paths of justice. We recall that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, do so in remembrance of my great love for you. And likewise, he took the cup. And he poured wine and he said, this, this is the wine of the new covenant, which has been poured out for you. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of my great love for you. God, we thank you for breathing this world into existence and proclaiming from its birth, it is good. We come to you with gratitude for the endless blessings that we see, feel, and know on our journey of life. We celebrate the rich diversity of your creation, every beautiful body, every shade of skin, every expression of love. Through your spirit, open our hearts to the joy we can find in the midst of life challenges. Remind us that we are loved fiercely and hurt, and however the world may try to hold us down or tell us who to be, remind us that nothing can separate us from your real presence. As we stand before this feast, we pray the words you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the same our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in singing our, our communion hymn. Let us break bread together. Let us break bread together. <laughs>
merciful and loving God, we ask that you would bless this bread and bless this wine that as we partake of it, we might be joined one with another and with all of the saints through time who have found strength and courage in the spirit of Jesus Christ to live and to work for a world that is full and abundant of your love and care. We ask that you would allow this to strengthen our hearts and give courage to our minds that we might be the church that you call us to be. God bless this bread and this wine and the people who partake, that we might forever be your representatives, your symbols of love in this world. Amen. So I invite you all to come forward now. <coughs> Now take, eat, and drink God's expression of love for you. So Hannah says, Amen. Right, Hannah? Amen. 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 There we are. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's say our prayer after communion. Thank you, Hannah. From these simple gifts of grape and grain, you have consecrated us as your children, called and sent to share your extravagant love with others. Open our eyes that we might see near us 
Open our lives that we might be agents of hope and love for our world. When we forget our holy calling, speak anew to our hearts and draw us back. This is our prayer in the name of all that is holy. Amen. I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to one another. Peace be Kind of trying to give Roger the eye cue, the cue with my eyes. Uh, but uh, I'll just go ahead and remind you that we've got, uh, I think, book club, book club is this week, right? No. No, no, we finished. Oh, we finished the book club. Well, see, this is why I should let Roger do it. Uh, uh, Thursday is Bible study. The link is uh, here. You can email us. We'll send you the link. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lee Abram, Abram Guerra, and I uh, have the honor of serving as the moderator here at uh, United Church on the Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Rev. Stephen. I'm still getting used to calling him Rev. Stephen uh, uh, for, for your message today. Um, you know, if you were in ancient Greece and you wanted to say hello, you would say "Kadas." Kadas is charism, right? It, it means grace. Kadas uh, is grace, uh, and and really, it's it's uh, so good to be reminded uh, of the gift that we've been given, our own self, our identity the gift of each other that we've been given. Um, and you know, I, I had, you guys, some of you guys met last weekend, uh, Donnie and Emily. Uh, I was talking to Donnie this week on the phone, uh, and he was telling me about a friend who was really concerned about baptism and whether or not certain people were doing it right in certain churches. Uh, and my reaction to it was, it's kind of a post-Genesis 3 view. Right after the fall, the most important thing is to save people. But I'm kind of more interested in the pre-Genesis three plan, where like you know God puts us and gives us stuff to do and gives us each other, and we sort of learn and grow uh, before the whole thing with the serpent and the apple and all that stuff. Uh, there was like a plan, right? And that plan continues. Each of us is given these gifts, and the main gift that we're given. Uh, you know, looking at Genesis 2, uh, is the work, right? The work that God has put in front of us. And the other main gift that we're given is each other. 
right? Because God looked at Adam and said, it's not good for him to be alone. Probably reflecting on his own reasons for creating Adam and Eve in the first place, that it's not good for God even to be alone. None of us should be alone. So thank you, uh, uh, Rev. Stephen, for, for touching on that theme. Certainly has me thinking a lot about uh, this conversation uh, and the purpose, really, of the church. Uh, you know, here at United, we say pretty much every week, uh, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you're welcome. And we really mean it. That's why we say it so much. Uh, uh, we've been an open and affirming church, open and affirming to LGBTQ plus people uh, for uh, since 1989. Uh, before that, we were involved in the apartheid, uh, uh, anti-apartheid uh, movement uh, uh, to try and end apartheid in South Africa. The, um, if you trace back in history all the way back to 1742, you can see United show up again and again and again. And here we are today. I'm not sure what the work is in 2024. I can I have some ideas, uh, but I'm sure that we have each other. So thank you for coming this morning. You could have been anywhere, and I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, have a good Sunday. <coughs> do the uh, call to offer. I think one of the things that I want to share with you all, that I didn't know as part of the sermon, but as part of where the sermon came from, is I have complete and utter faith that each and every one of you are here today. Each and every one of you are here each time that you are here because God has something for you to do. Because your presence makes us a better place, a better reflection of God's love. So if it seems like I only talk about you all a lot, and I'm not a fire-breathing progressive, or I'm not telling you all to get out in the streets and shake your foot, I mean, we can do that, and we are going to do that. And because of a community, that's what we do, right? I mean, United is just one of those churches that if there is a protest, you all are going to be there somewhere. I know that. <laughs> but what I also want you to know is that you are precious to this place. You are, pre and you know, you get tired of hearing that, I know, because that, that sounds like, oh, well, you told us that last week, you tell us that this week. But you can actually forget it in the ebb and flow of things, and the organizations you belong to may not tell you that enough. So, I'm telling you, I have complete faith that God has you in this place at this time for God's purposes of love and care in the world. And I give thanks that we can share this moment in time with you. So that was the bonus sermon. But I just wanted to tell you all what I think is one of the most critically important things, because if we don't tell one another that, then we'll find all of the reasons in the world to reinforce what the world tells us about each other and why it is that we shouldn't be here together. We come to the time in our service now where we invite you to share with us in this ministry to give as much as you're able, to give what you are able, knowing that all that you give will be uh, put toward making this place one that shines with God's love in this broken world. I invite the ushers to come forward.
invitation. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for your grace, for this community of faith, for the gifts of our lives. Bless these offerings today that they might be used to further your reign of righteousness here and now. Work through each of us and through the ministries of this congregation that we might glorify you in all we do. Join me now in singing our closing hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
worship has ended, let us begin. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.